I'll come back to how to fix democracy. I hope this is fast becoming your favorite show on contemporary democracy. We're in the latter part of our third series, which is focused on the challenges and opportunities of citizenship in the early part of the 21st century. Uh, for our loyal viewers and listeners, uh, our second series focused on the challenges and opportunities of uh, building a relationship or perhaps undermining the relationship between capitalism and democracy. Uh, and today uh, in our conversation, we're going to bring those two conversations together, the issue of reforming or reimagining capitalism and the issue of reforming or reimagining the idea of citizenship. My guest today is John Alexander. He is the co-founder of New Citizenship Project. Um, it's a, a think tank, a, a consultancy group on citizenship and advertising. Uh, which has been around for about eight years. And he's the author of a really interesting upcoming book, uh, Citizens, uh, comes out in February 2020. John Alexander, welcome to How to Fix Democracy. Thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, John, I, I know you, uh, you originally came onto our radar uh, because you met um, uh, Irene... Uh, Brahm, uh, who runs Bertelsmann Foundation of North America at the Athens Forum on Democracy. You made a, a brilliant presentation, a kind of three-part provocation in which you suggested, and I'm sure this will be essential to your new book, that there was an essential incompatibility between the idea of being a citizen and the idea of being a consumer. Perhaps we might begin with you explaining why these two don't and can't go together. Yeah, so I guess the way I see the world I th and the moment in time we're living in, the broad moment in time, is that we're essentially in the, living through the collapse of what I would call the consumer story. And so the way I use these words is, is really to refer not just to, not just to roles that we play on any, on any given day, but, but to stories that sit underneath those roles, deep uh, psychological, almost moral stories that inform how we play all the roles in our lives. And what I contend is that we've been living in the consumer story probably since the Second World War. And, and what that story does is it, it, it offers us an underlying logic that says that the right thing to do is to, is to get the best deal for yourself, to look out for number one, to choose the best option for you from those that are offered. And on the premise that if everyone does that, then the best society will result. And this shows up in, in pretty much every aspect of our lives. And, and it's this that is incompatible, I believe, with the idea of the citizen. And, and, and the second part of my contention about the moment of time we're living in really is that even as the consumer story collapses in on itself, what we're seeing and what we potentially could step into is the emergence of, of what you might call the citizen story. And so if the consumer story says that the right thing to do is to look out for number one, etc., the citizen story says the right thing to do is to get involved, to shape the context of your own life, to contribute your ideas and energy and resources and wisdom to the, to the discussion about what the good of society might look like. And so the basis is rather than individual self-interest adds up to collective interest, the basis is all of us are smarter than any of us. And so if we can tap into all of those ideas and energy and resources, then that will be a much more effective way to the best society so it's that it's at that level it's not that we don't consume but it's that we don't have to be consumers and and we can't be consumers and citizens at that at that level uh john uh in our last series our second series on the relationship between capitalism and democracy we had the very distinguished harvard university academic robert putnam he's most famous for his book bowling alone he has a new book out it's called the upswing and he has a historical narrative. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book. It's, a, it's um, classic Putnam, very brilliant, very erudite, uh, very convincing. He suggests a, a historical narrative um, fitting your uh, me uh, into what he calls the upswing. He said in the 1940s uh, and 50s, uh, we did think like citizens, and perhaps even in the 1930s, out of the Great Society and the New Deal, um, there was a collective communitarian culture in American society and American capitalism. 
Then came Reagan, the reaction, Milton Friedman, the neoliberalism, which has shaped the world for the last 40 or 50 years. And now he suggests we can go back, back to the original principles of the New Deal, of the Great Society. What's your historical narrative? Are, are you suggesting that we have a model to work off in terms of citizenship? I know you're very interested in the Greece of antiquity. Can we learn from Aristotle? I also know you're very interested in the Eng English Civil War. Do we need to go back to the arguments of the levelers of, um, of, uh, of, of, of people involved in the Putney debates? How do we think of this challenge historically, John? I would argue we need to dig back a bit deeper than, than Putnam argues. So my, I, I would argue that what, what came before the consumer story was probably, as, as the sort of dominant global story, was something more like the subject. So if as consumers, so, so the, the, the third instalment, as it were, the subject story, argue, the, 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 the argument of the subject story is the right thing to do is to keep your head down, do as you're told and get what you're given. And, and if everyone does that, then the best society results because the God-given few who knew best will lead us to the to the future. And, and I think actually that, that the consumer story that came from out of that after the two world wars was was actually a, a pretty liberating shift, was a positive shift from who that. articulated it. Who do you think is the most compelling, convincing uh, theorist of consumer society? Uh, I would, I mean, the, the most compelling creator of consumer society was probably Eddie Bernays, uh, and that was that was between the two world wars. The so inventor that, of uh, advertising, and I know, John, that your background before you did this um, consulting group, your background is in advertising, and yet you seem to suggest that advertising in cultural and economic terms represents the backbone of our uh, consumer culture, the cult of the consumer. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, I started my career in advertising in around 2003. I went into the industry really off the back of 9-11 uh, and seeing and hearing the, the call to go shopping uh, in, in, in the words of our, of our leaders at that time. And, but very soon after I arrived in the advertising industry, I began to ask myself, I, my, my first boss actually described my job to me. He said, what you've got to understand is that the average consumer sees 3,000 commercial messages a day. And your job is to cut through that. And for the first few years of my career, I was quite focused on that intellectual task of cutting through. And then I started to think, like, what, what's the impact of that 3,000? Like, what are we doing to ourselves when we tell ourselves we're consumers 3,000 odd times a day? And what, what impact does that have on our relationships with one another and what we think is possible? And that, uh, that John, really... Perhaps you might say something about Bernays and, 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 and how you see the, the pioneers of, electronic advertising in the early part of the 20th century is shaping our democracy. I mean, Bernays did it pretty directly in several instances uh, and, and was the, the architect and the, 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 uh, the, the, the influence behind several of, the, of, of America's less proud moments on the global stage as they've come out, so uh, various coups and so on. But I think that the, the role that Bernays had and that the philosophy that he had came actually from his uncle Sigmund Freud and 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 the the analysis that that World War One was largely the was the result of kind of animal instincts on the part of humanity a sort of deep badness in human nature that needed to be controlled and directed and channeled into something less harmful and this is why Bernays talked about manufacturing or engineering consent and 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 attached the sort of satisfaction of human needs to material consumption uh, essentially as a way to stop us from uh our, to, to protect us from our deeper bad nature to, in to, a funny to, kind of way what you're suggesting then is Bernays reinvents thomas hobbs in in the age of advertising that's absolutely right yeah i think um this idea of kind of red in tooth and claw that that, that is taken so uh, uncritically is probably, I, I mean, sometimes I describe consumerism essentially as a kind of, and the consumer story and as a sort of uh, species level self-hatred. It's, it's us just telling ourselves that we're not good enough actually to face the problems that, that we face, that, that all we're good enough to do is to look out for our own self-interest. And when we do that, we actually deeply undermine our cap capability to respond to great global challenges in a way that's completely unnecessary. Like we, when you give people the the, 
the space and permission and, and possibility to get involved in the world, to contribute and shape the world for the better, then that's that's what we want to do. And I think a huge amount of the challenge we face at the moment isn't about conditioning people or teaching people. Well, it's actually about getting out of our own way and realizing and unleashing the potential that we have that, that's in every one of us to, to, to contribute to the work of creating a better world. That sounds like advertising talk though, John. Um, there is of course a great tradition of, of critiquing capitalism and consumer society. It's called Marxism, um, it's great history, perhaps in some ways a failure over the last 200 years. Uh, we've done a number of conversations uh, with Richard Wolff, for example, one of America's leading socialist or Marxist thinkers. Are you a Marxist? Do you believe that capitalism and freedom are essentially incompatible? I, to be honest, I don't identify as a Marxist or not. I, I, my, what I'm really interested in, I find, I find conversations about capitalism kind of unhelpful, to be honest. I, I think that we You're end up in... You're describing capitalism in your, in your work. You, you, you see the problem as this advertising saturated capitalism that's the core problem of our age no, I, I see consumerism as the problem in my work and the two are distinct like i i capitalism to me is a is a is an articulation of of, of the society that results the, the consumerism as i describe it is a, is a is a story of the individual and and whereas i believe that when we start talking about capitalism the best we seem to come up with in when we talk about antidotes to capitalism is language like post-capitalism or anti-capitalism and all of these things are just actually referring to what they're not and so end up keeping us trapped. Whereas if you think about consumerism and you say, well, what if, what if we identify differently? You're essentially flipping the telescope and you're saying we, we can choose to step into any one of us in any given moment or any organization can choose to step from a consumer story into a citizen story. It may be that what manifests as a result of us collectively doing that is something other than capitalism. But I don't feel the need to, to engage in a kind of grand, grand theory uh, in that way. I'm much more about going, what is it for us to claim our agency and to unleash the agency of others? Uh, and and let the let let the systems evolve from there. It's a it's not a theory of change that says I'm going to be some smart guy in a in a in a room abstracted who's going to design the next social system. It's a it's a theory of change that's much more sort of social acupuncture. It's about in, in, intervening in multiple places and unleashing the energy that's already there. You, you talk about social acupuncture. Uh, who who is the actual uh, acupuncturist? Is it the government? Are it agencies like yourself? Uh, or is it all of us as individuals? You use the A word, John, agency. Is that the thing you are trying to unleash uh, in your yes. work, in your book, in your consulting group? Yeah, absolutely. And I think to your question of who are the, who's the acupuncturist, it, in a way, I'm more interested in what are the acupuncture points? It's like, and I, and I think they're everywhere. So it's, it's, in government, it might be. Uh, I mean, the the I know you've had many of these uh, conversations on this podcast, but it's the it, an acupuncture moment was arguably the Irish Citizens Assembly that formed the the, ref, the the legislative recommendation on abortion that then went to referendum. Another acupuncture point in the world is 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 Taiwan and how that how their government has responded to to COVID with their fast, fun, fair response and, and mass radically involved their society. Another acupuncture point though might be in the business world. There's a, a, I tell the story in my book of, of, the, of the rise of a, of a fascinating company called Brewdog in the UK, a, a craft beer company that has effectively invented equity crowdfunding and, 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 and established some really fascinating participatory mechanics in the business world. Equally in the charity sector, uh, in the UK, an organisation called the National Trust, which I have very close affiliation with, has done some fascinating work on, on seeing people not just as consumers of visitor attractions who, who thereby donate to a charity, but, but actually participants in, in a movement that's about the importance of place in society. And so, so these, all of these are acupuncture points because you're not looking for a kind of a grand imposition. That said, for this transition to really happen, government... The shift, a shift in the nature of democracy is critical. 
Because I think what I would argue we're living in right now, or, or the, the way we use the term democracy right now, is actually only a consumer democracy. It's a, it's a democracy in which our agency is limited to choosing between the options that someone else offers every X years, rather than a dynamic participatory citizen democracy where we have actually a role on an ongoing basis. And that, that for me, is the critical shift. So how do we begin fixing ourselves? How do we liberate, emancipate ourselves from this consumer being which we seem to have slipped into, John? I mean, just, just to be clear, I, I, I do think it starts with ourselves, but I think it is about ourselves in community and in context. So as a citizen, you're a citizen of something, and that's the first, the first step, really. Uh, one of the things we talk about in the book is the, the idea of finding home, uh, and so, so a citizen, uh, the first step is to identify and, 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 and commit to the domains in which you have agency and find those around you who can build that age, with whom you can build that agency together. And that might be a geographic place and leaning into sort of what are the, what are the community initiatives in your local area and, and finding them and, 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 and linking together with them is a very powerful way to start this work. But it might also be your organisation or, your, or even your sector. Some of what I'm most interested in that's going on at the moment uh, actually is in that space of employees as citizens shaping their organisations rather than just as consumers of jobs in return for salaries. So, so what, one example very quickly is there's um, uh, uh, McKinsey, uh, 11 McKinsey employees back in March wrote a letter to the managing partners uh, raising their concerns about the company's engagement with heavy fossil fuel emitters. That letter has now been signed by over 1,100 McKinsey consultants, uh, and 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 is and and the company is having to respond and and deal and and no one knows yet where that's going to go. That's that's live as as you and I are talking. Similarly, that, that in the advertising industry in the UK, a, a group of advertising industry professionals have just uh, worked with a group of scientists to to uh, to to launch the concept of advertised emissions, and 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 they've 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 uh, researched and found that that the that on the advertising industry's own effectiveness data, it adds, the advertising industry adds 28% to every UK individual's carbon footprint. Now, these are, these are examples of, and they're particularly related to climate, which, are, which is clearly the most pressing issue of our time. But these are examples of people finding their agency by coming together with others, putting their heads up and saying, this is, I, I can see that the story is broken. I can see that the world is, and, and I want to find others and find my agency with them. And I think that is the first step for all of us is to say, what are we part of? What, what are the domains that we have some agency in as individuals, but, but could have more agency in if we find the others and, and could build an intervention point, could build an acupuncture point by doing so? I'm intrigued by your, um, your story of Brewdog. Sounds like a fascinating company. Seems like the kind of company that another of our uh, guests on the show, Rebecca Henderson, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School, colleague of Robert Putnam, uh, writes about in her book, Reimagining Capitalism. Uh, I know you're not necessarily keen on focusing on, on the word capitalism, but Henderson suggests, and Ronald Cohen is someone else we've had on the show who makes the same argument, that um, the real challenge, as you suggested, is reforming the organizations, the capitalist organizations we work in, whether it's Brewdog or McKinsey or um, Google or Facebook or any of these other companies, are you suggesting that capitalism then can be reimagined? Capitalism can be reformed or maybe not using that word capitalism you're not keen on, corporations, that they are the key vehicles in your acupunctural um, revolution? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, again, I, I, I think of them just as more acupuncture points. I think of, but I think that the, the larger they are, the more powerful uh, they are a lot of the time. I mean, I'm particularly fascinated by the question of what, what would it look like if Facebook slash Meta slash actually Mark Zuckerberg thought of people as citizens rather than consumers. I would, I would argue that m almost all of the problems at Facebook or, the, or the, the damaging consequences of Facebook's activities stem from a core mindset that people are consumers and that the, that the model uh, 
that defines that organization is 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 one where our time is the if not ourselves are kind of our kind of the product and so our attention is traded and it, and and yet if actually facebook were designed around an idea of people as citizens if facebook were uh were governed in a way that was participatory, were governed by its users in a meaningful sense. Then and 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 it had it it embraced some of these some of these technologies of participatory democracy and actually became a pioneer of collective decision making. Facebook could be an astonishing power for 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 good and for the renewal of democracy. I think as well as the renewal of 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 what we might call capitalism. I'm, I'm also very interested. I'm, I'm working at the moment with a with a group of people who are who are looking at what it might look like to to introduce citizens' jury processes into corporate annual reporting on a on a very widespread basis, such that actually you might renew a contract between citizen and and corporation between corporation and society by bringing. Uh, deliberative democracy into into that process of reporting. I think some people on the left, John, would be very troubled by this, the idea that we can essentially take the principles of capitalism and apply them to democracy using the example of Facebook. Facebook's probably the most profitable company in history. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg's one of the richest men in history. He's worth uh, 50, 100 billion dollars. And, and, and I think that's what guides him. Are you saying that Zuckerberg should reform Facebook because there's money in citizenship? Or are you saying that Zuckerberg should reform Facebook because he has a moral responsibility towards the rest of us? I think he should reform Facebook because he has a moral responsibility, but I think that- but He has shareholders, John, um, and, and they would rebel against that within the conventional structures of capitalism. People at his general meetings would stand up and say, I want you to make money. You're not in the business of doing good. And if you want to get into the business of doing good, become a nonprofit. Well, the interesting thing about Facebook in particular and Zuckerberg is that he owns more than half of the company himself, as I understand it. Right, so, so he could stand up himself and, and have a- <laughs> Exactly. A seriousness. But, um, no, I, I hear your point. And, I hear your point. and this, I mean, is I, a, this is a conversation we had with Rebecca Henderson and people on the left, people like uh, Wolf. Um, are, do, do we need to reform the very structures of corporations to change them, maybe to create a third way, neither for-profit or non-profit, somehow combining the two, as, as Ronald Cohen suggests? I mean... Again, absolutely yes. I, I, my business, the New Citizenship Project, is a certified B corporation. We we have a we we have articulated a social and environmental purpose and, and report on our impact on a on a on an annual on a biannual basis as part of our, our certification. And and I think that those schemes are vitally important. And I know Ron Cohen talks about uh, some of those things and and some some other approaches to a similar end. I mean, but I, again, I'm I'm more interested in in where we go from where we are and how how a shift in mindset might unlock uh, dynamics that we can't necessarily kind of identify every every outcome of so and to your to your point about um whether there is i guess the implicit question of is there a business model in this i mean take take brewdog they they're one of the they were one of the Sunday Times is fastest growing, 100 fastest growing companies for seven years in a row. And, and, and they have a market cap that's, that's far in excess as a, as a proportion, as a, um, in proportion to annual revenues than of any other brewery company. And, and a huge, purport, huge reason for that is their re relationship with the, the 170 odd thousand people they call equity punks who are, who are their crowd equity shareholders. And that, that that relationship though also holds them to account in some really interesting ways. It's that the, the founders credit the equity punk community with their decisions to become a living wage employer uh, as one of the first living wage employers in in the UK to to invest in pioneering pioneering eco breweries to 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 commit to a full scale environmental program. And, and, and to be clear though, I should I should say that they aren't perfect either. But ultimately. Who controls these private corporations to make them responsible? Do we have to rely on the morality of the Zuckerbergs, uh, the Larry Pages, the Steve Jobs, the people who run Brewdogs? What happens if they suddenly wake up one morning and 
and and and and and become a little more evil than they were when they went to bed. I think it's a really important question, and, and case in point is Brewdog. In the last last uh, couple of years, they've had some really bad run-ins. There was a an open letter to a major UK newspaper uh, in in 2021 calling calling out at what they said was a 60 employees calling out what they said was a toxic workplace culture at Brewdog, mm. and, and 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 accusing actually one of the founders of having lost the lost the founding spirit, lost his sense of what they were truly there for. And, and I think, and this is where I, I would go back to this, this the, the, the reason why I say democracy is the key sphere and actually bringing some of the emerging techniques of deliberative and participatory democracy into the corporate sphere, because I think there is a way of having some much more interesting and dynamic accountability structures in the corporate, corporate sphere as well. Brewdog, Brewdog could do this in a really interesting way. They have 170,000 equity punks, equity crowd, uh, equity shareholders. Uh, crowd funders. They don't actually have much meaningful power in that organization. And they need to be they need to be given that power, both for the moral imperative that that, that the company needs to be held to account by those people, uh, but also but for the for the for the for the business success imperative, which is actually when you tap into the ideas and energy of those people, the company will do better. It will be more sensitive to the to the risks and dangers, and it will it will move in a, in a better direction. And that's that's much of the critique, much of the sort of uh, proposal that I would offer towards towards Facebook. Like I think I mean I, I actually started a petition back in 2015 when when Zuckerberg when Mark Zuckerberg first set up the the Zuckerberg Chan Initiative, the the foundation. And what I said in that petition was that like, give us give us power, not charity. Like what? Don't don't just don't just put some of your shares into uh, the, the dividends from your shares into create uh, funds to give away, give, give that power to the, to the, to the users of Facebook. If, if Facebook's users had meaningful power in that organization, I think that could be transformative in what the organization did and, and, and how it operated. John, you talk about participatory deliberative democracy, and I know um, you're a big fan of what happened with the citizen assemblies in Ireland. What is it about these assemblies that you find so inspiring and important? I mean, I love the, I love um, James Fishkin, the, the Stanford professor's uh, phrase, democracy under good conditions. It's the idea that actually creating the space for people to come together, for people to have meaningful power and agency in relation to an issue and to deliberate and discuss with those not, not exactly like them, uh, it, it's just it just creates the opportunity to see humanity at its at its best and 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 for people to to come together across divides i i i'm particularly struck by the irish case because of the way it was followed by the referendum uh and speaking as a brit the one on abortion of course exactly yes yeah. so sorry that the irish citizens assembly in 20 i think formed the the recommendation that access to abortion would be legal up to 12 weeks which was then put to a national referendum in Ireland in, in May 2018 and passed with two thirds of the vote, I think. And, and, and it was really fascinating to compare and contrast the, the, the mood and the, um, the nature of the debate around that referendum with the, with the Brexit referendum two years before, whichever side of that debate you were on. And, to, and, and, and also to compare and contrast the, the mood that in, of the nation that has resulted uh, afterward. So Britain feels very divided, still feels quite fragmented, uh, and, and trust, uh, trust in government, trust of government in citizens feels very low. Whereas in Ireland, uh, and, and you can see that, I think, in, in things like the, the, the fact that we got very quickly to 60 something percent vaccination rates uh, and then have, have stopped dead. In Ireland, the, 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 the nature of the sort of so, civic conversation following on from that, that moment in 2018 has been, a, has been one of a nation that felt more coherent. The Citizens Assembly has become a standing feature of, of Irish democracy. And that that what that the signal that has sent about the relationship between citizen and state, the, the the story that that tells about the role of the individual in society, I think is a major part of the of increased levels of of not not sort of blind trust in a particular party or whatever, but a sense of of a meaningful stake in that society. And 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 I I do believe that things like vaccination rates, which are much higher now in Ireland, are are, are symptomatic of 
of that better, stronger relationship between citizen and state. And, and that, that I think is the key for me. I mean, the limitation for me of citizens assemblies is, 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 that, is that in and of themselves, that core process is, is, is a relatively small number of people. And this again is why the Irish example is so powerful because what followed on from it opened that conversation out to the entire nation. And I'm really interested in how we might complement citizens assemblies as processes with open idea generation campaigns, with referenda, with matched crowdfunding uh, processes that, that enable communities to take action off the back of the recommendations provided by citizens assemblies. And we've, we've been playing with some of these or working with some of these ideas as new citizenship project in some smaller contexts. What about, I think, um, uh, John, you, you've talk, you talked about belonging and the importance of belonging and perhaps even blood in ideas of citizenship. What about the movements of citizenship in countries like Hungary and Poland and the United States that are focusing citizenship on identity, often on race? Um, are you uncomfortable with those or is that an acceptable side of the coin in terms of your acupunctural uh, metaphor for uh, reinventing democracy? No, I, I think those are a perversion of the concept of citizenship. Uh, uh, if anything, a reduction of it. So in, in, in my book, I talk about the difference between citizenship as status and citizenship as practice. To my, in the, in the ideas I work with, citizenship is, is not about a passport you hold or a, or a place you were born. And actually the, the etymology of this is fascinating. The, we tend to think that the, that the word citizen probably just by sort of instinctive wisdom derives from city and therefore is a geographically focused thing. There is a city and the citizens are of the city. Actually, it's the other way around. Like if you go back into the, to the, to the original derivations, the word citizen literally translates, uh, the, the word kibis translates as, as, as uh, uh, together people, people, uh, people who are defined by their togetherness, people who cannot be understood as individuals. And, and a city is simply who, a place- Who, who, where who was people. doing the defining, John, here? Because I'm not sure that's actually right. I mean, the modern notions of citizenship are very much born in, in antiquity um, and, and the polis, the, the foundations of our concept of citizenship are very much rooted in the city. In fact, Socrates, when given the choice of whether to be executed or to be exiled from the city, chose death. Um, so I, isn't geography important here in some ways? Maybe you might not like the idea of blood and democracy and identity, but those are realities. Otherwise, we just have world government, don't we? No, I don't think that's true. I think I think the idea of citizenship as practice, as 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 an orientation to the world, and and more as a verb than as a noun, more as a more as a practice than a status, is something that's that's gaining momentum. Look at what uh, Eric Liu is doing in the in the US with the citizen. Eric was. Uh, you, I don't mean to keep on name dropping, but Eric was another guest on our third series. So, I'm in the uh, right we had company. One conversation really. about citizenship with Eric too. And, and, and Barristan Thurston, who you probably also had on here with his no, podcast, How to him. Citizen. He's on our, yeah, he's on our <laughs> wish list, but uh, we could have him. We got you. No, but that, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, the idea of the idea of the individual, the idea that the right thing to do is to lean in to shape and to contribute your view, not the not not to sort of claim status over one another. Because actually, that that kind of citizenship is becoming meaningless. Like. Uh, in the the age, it's still real. I mean, you're you're talking to me from uh, London. I'm in California. We still have to live somewhere. We still carry passports around with us. We still pay taxes. We still have government. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not saying uh, I'm not necessarily saying that 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 I'm I'm not saying that the nation state is 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 at the end of its use. I th I'm I'm more interested in what the relationship between citizen and state is, just as I'm more interested in the relationship between individual and organization than I am about whether we call it a business or call it capitalism. I'm, I'm much more interested in the dynamic of the, of, the, of the interaction and of the relationship than I am in the kind of, uh, in the blocks that we, that we might talk about. But I, but I think these things can be useful. I think, I mean, that, uh, though that said, I think one of the most interesting, arguably the most interesting thing that I've seen in the last year has been the, the Global Assembly project that, that, that did seek to identify 100 people as representative of the world's population and bring them together to deliberate uh, on climate and, and set forth a, a yeah. set of priorities ahead of the, ahead of the, the COP26 process. I think 
but uh, but yeah i mean i'm i'm not uh i'm not here talking about um the end of the nation state or anything like but i uh, but i think that the reason for that as as i say earlier and maybe it makes me a frustration frustrating person to talk to but it's it's i'm much more interested in standing where we are thinking about the identity we hold and 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 how we consider our our role in the world and shifting that by mood by going i don't i'm not going to be a subject who has stuff done to me i'm not going to be a consumer who just has stuff done for me and chooses between a limited set of options i'm going to orient as a citizen and i'm going to get involved in shaping the world with the agency i do have and cultivate that agency and others as well and and what results from that from whatever domain i i i i identify as a as a citizen of of london as a citizen of england as a citizen of britain as a citizen of I'd love to identify, I still identify as a citizen of Europe, as a citizen of the world, as a citizen of the biosphere. Like I, I'm, I, I consider myself all of those things as a sort of nested construct, not, not, not having to choose between one and the other. And I think that that is the kind of, if there is a way in which I would consider this geographically bounded, it's more nested than it is oppositional. How can new technology, particularly the technology of Web3, the peer to peer technology, for example, empowering cryptocurrency. Um, how can these new technologies, which get beyond web, the web 2.0 of companies like Google and Facebook, how can that provide the, the foundation, the infrastructure for your, your many points of light world, your, 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 your multiplicity of acupunctural points, which I love? I think, so look, I think we are in a moment in time when I said before we're in a kind of collapse and an emergence, but I, I think the real the, the way I've come to see it in the kind of context of COVID and this this sort of throwing up of everything that we're that we're experiencing this 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 moment is is actually there are kind of three futures emerging that the, the subject sto- future the subject story has kind of come roaring back and under and, authoritarianism and, whether it's Orban or Trump or Erdogan or China or, or whatever or yeah. Beate. And the, and the consumer story is also kind of rearing its head as a, as a sort of turbocharged version. And, and much of the kind of Web3 uh, work is coming in, is serving both of those futures as well. I mean, we, we see sort of the SpaceX and the, and the Miami Tech Weeks where it's sort of we can we can and the sovereign individual story where we can kind of uh, step outside the bounds of anything and 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 those who are smart enough can create their own interactions with not with one another outside the view of the state and and create a future where where the individual becomes as as a god and creates their own communities as they see fit and and and, and in those worlds and and yet there is also this emerging citizen future there is also the the kind of so we have the subject we have the consumer and then we have the citizen and you're suggesting we need to choose the third door citizenship right yeah and i think the web3 technologies can serve and will serve whichever mindset we inhabit will create as the what's the um the the marshall mcluhanism uh that that the, the the medium is the message we, we and and some of that i think involves the idea that 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 if we step into a, a store if we step into a technology with a given story we all thought the internet would be the great democratizer many people thought the television would be the great democratizer but if we step into them see, seeking to use them only as markets then they'll shape us back if we step into them seeking to use them as medium of control then they'll shape us back so I think for me, the, the mindset is the critical thing. And it's, and it's about opening up into that mindset. And then these technologies can be deeply powerful, but we're going to have to decide what we want to do with them. As McLuhan famously said, first we create our technologies, then those technologies create us. And I think that's the essence of your work, um, John Alexander, at the New Citizen Project and in your new book. I really want to thank you so much for such a, an interesting, combative, deep, reflective conversation. Thank you so much, John Alexander. Thanks for having me.